Welcome. We'll be talking about arterial line placement. This is a pretty short video. It builds upon the previous central venous access video and it uses the same framework. So a lot of that was spelled out in the first video, uh, which is why this one is so short. It uh, really just focuses on the information needed to place arterial lines and to manage them and take care of them and a little bit of uh, technique as well. So let's get right to it. Arterial lines. Once again, we'll be using a 10 step approach to our procedure and the steps are indication, contraindications, complications, anatomy, informed consent, procedure preparation, personal protection, the procedure itself, confirmation, and communication. And we'll go through each of these steps in detail. The first step is indications, and the indications for your arterial line placement will be one of two main indications, either the need for continuous hemodynamic monitoring or the need for greater than four arterial blood gas samples in a given 24-hour period. And this one requires some judgment. This is an indication to balance the risk of multiple individual arterial sticks against a single arterial stick for an arterial line and then its maintenance. Once you have your indication, you do want to consider your contraindications, and most are going to be relative, some are absolute, and the places that you'll look for these possible contraindications will be your history and physical. In your past medical history, you want to look for things like Berger's disease or thromboangitis obliterans, chronic and acute renal failure may be a relative contraindication if that site is going to be needed in the near future for a fistula, Coagulopathy is always of concern. Past surgical history, if you plan to do a radio artery harvest on that side, it's preferable not to use that site for an arterial line. If there's going to be a fistula creation or if there's trauma to the arm or to the vessel. Allergies, think about what types of medications and products you'll be using for the procedure and whether or not you can use them or whether or not you need to modify your approach. And these might be things like lidocaine, either betadine or chlorhexidine or adhesive tape. Medications you should be concerned about are Coumadin, Heparin, Lovenox, Aspirin, any anticoagulants or antiplatelet medications. And again, these are relative. They might not stop you from performing the procedure. However, it is important to have them in consideration because they will affect how you consent for the procedure and whether or not you want to wait to do the procedure and whether or not the risk of complications outweighs the benefits of the indication. Current laboratory values, again, you should look at your platelets and your coagulation studies. Your absolute contraindications would obviously be a previous radial artery harvest at the site. The radial artery is your chosen insertion site. If there's a previous arterectomy or bypass at that site, if you have an extremity with either non-palpable or non-dopplerable pulses, it should be avoided. If the patient has an absent palmar arch, a radial A-line should not be placed on that side or if there is an arch but there is poor collateral circulation, or if there is infection at the site of insertion. The dominant artery to the hand is the ulnar artery, and most people will have a palmar arch, such that if the radial artery becomes occluded, collateral circulation can be delivered from the ulnar artery. Some people have an absent palmar arch, however, and in that absence, the ulnar artery supplies one half of the hand and the radial artery supplies roughly the other half of the hand. And loss of the radial artery in that situation would lead to ischemia in that region of the hand. Step three is to consider your complications, and this is weighing your risk versus benefit and whether or not you should undertake the procedure for the particular patient. And your complications can be broken into insertion, maintenance, and removal type complications. Your insertion complications might be placement failure, arterial spasm, and this may cause transient ischemia to the extremity distal to the area of spasm, and it may make subsequent attempts at an arterial placement difficult or temporarily at least impossible. The arteries can be unforgiving, and if you attempt multiple passes and stick the artery several times but are unsuccessful in threading your guide wire or placing your catheter, the artery can spasm down, making it more difficult during subsequent attempts. Hemorrhage can obviously occur in subsequent hematoma. Nerve can be hit and resulting nerve injury or peripheral neuropathy can result. 
Ischemia to the hand can result due to damage and loss of perfusion, and the nidus for pseudoaneurysm can be created. The maintenance complications can be catheter failure, kinking, poor waveform or poor data yielded from the catheter. If your indication is for continuous hemodynamic monitoring and the information yielded is not suitable to act upon clinically, then you are not yielding the benefit desired from the procedure. Thromboembolism can occur, air embolism can occur through poor technique when sampling, cellulitis and infection can occur, bacteremia and sepsis, ischemia distal to the site of insertion, and extremity loss. Complications that occur during removal would be hemorrhage, hematoma formation, and it's important to keep in mind that patients can often have a traumatic self-removal and lose a significant amount of blood before it is recognized and pressure is applied by the nearest clinician. Step four is to review your anatomy, and the two most common sites for radial artery replacement are going to be your radial artery and your femoral artery. And the relevant anatomy for your radial artery position will be your radial styloid, which is the head of the radius bone, the radial artery, and then the flexor carpi radialis tendon. And the radial artery is located longitudinally between these two structures. The distal portion of the radius bone is the radial styloid head. Slightly medial to it will be the flexor carpi radialis tendon. And in between the two structures, you should feel the pulse of the radial artery. It is important that your site of insertion not be too distal, as this will allow for significant movement of the catheter and kinking and catheter dysfunction. Insertion slightly more proximal allows for support from the wrist for the catheter itself. For your femoral anatomy, again, it is important to remember your mnemonic navel, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, and lymphatics. And it is also important to remember that the mnemonic is navel inwards. So on the right side, it will be N-A-V-E-L. On the left side, it will be L-E-V-A-N, if you're reading it from right to left. It is important to perform an ALIS test to ensure that there is adequate ulnar circulation should the radial artery become compromised. And this is performed by having the patient either squeeze their hand or if they are unconscious, closing their hand and wrapping it tightly with the coband temporarily and applying pressure to both the radial artery and the ulnar artery. And then having the patient either unclench their hand or remove the wrap from around their hand and then releasing pressure on the ulnar artery to ensure that the whole hand receives circulation and becomes pink again. If the patient has a patent palmar arch, then the patient has a negative Allen's test. If only half of the hand becomes pink and the other hand remains pallorous, and the patient does not have a patent palmar arch, then the patient has a positive Allen's test. The other way to perform this is with pulse oximetry, and a pulse oximeter can be placed on the thumb or first finger, and again, this can be performed while the patient is awake or asleep, and pressure would similarly be applied to the radial artery and the ulnar artery until the waveform disappears and then pressure will be released from the ulnar artery and the monitor observed for a return of the waveform with the pulse ox on the radial distribution side. If the waveform returns, then the patient has a negative Allen test and a present palmar arch. And if the waveform does not return or if returns very sluggishly, then the patient has a positive Allen test. It is possible to place halines in an axillary position, although we will not be discussing it more significantly than just mentioning it in this particular lecture. While anatomically it's possible to place halines brachially, it is not advised to as there is no collateral circulation and the vessel caliber size is somewhat smaller relative to say the axillary at that point. If the patient were to have a significant complication with the radial artery, the ulnar artery would continue to supply blood to the hand. However, if the patient were to have a complication with the brachial artery, there is not significant enough collateral circulation such that the forearm would continue to receive adequate blood. The picture on the upper right is an example of an intact columnar arch anatomy. Step five is informed consent. And once you've ensured that you do have an indication and you've taken into consideration all of your relative and absolute contraindications and ensured that it is possible and appropriate to perform the procedure, 
and reviewed all the possible complications and weighed the risk versus benefits and examined the patient's anatomy and ensured that the patient is amenable to having the procedure performed, it is then and only then possible to obtain informed consent. Step six is procedure preparation, and you will need to gather your sterile supplies and your non-sterile supplies. Your sterile supplies will be your gloves, your disinfectant, a sterile drape, towels, injectable anesthetic without additives, a syringe with both large gauge needle to draw up and smaller gauge needle to inject, the arterial line catheter itself, suture, needle driver, scissors, and an ultrasound sterile sheet. Your non-sterile equipment will be your monitor setup and your ultrasound if used. It is important to set up your non-sterile equipment first and you will need to set up your monitor, make sure you have a transducer box and a cable, a pressure bag set up, and a transducer and connecting to them. When positioning the patient, it is important to make sure that the patient is in a comfortable position, usually in bed in a supine position. Make sure you take down the ipsilateral bed rail so it is out of your way. Place a chuck underneath your procedural field to keep the area clean. Risk forward setups can be used, plus or minus, depending on your preference. Make sure that your monitor is visible so that when you hook up the line, you can ensure that you have an adequate waveform. Restraints are often only needed if they're lightly sedated. If they're fully sedated, they already have chemical restraints in place. If they're lightly sedated or have altered mental status, they might not be able to comply with a verbal request to not move. Physical restraints uh, may be needed as well, but the best way to really keep a patient calm is to have extra personnel, and this can either be done through verbal reassurance and redirection by nursing, or by having them hold their hand out of the sterile area such that they don't move. It is preferable not to give them additional chemical sedation. Step seven is personal protection, and as the operator, you should be wearing your gowns, gloves, mask, and cap, and anyone else in the room should have a cap and mask as well. Step eight is the actual insertion, and the first thing you need is to prep and drape. If you are prepping for a radial A-line, you want to prep circumferentially, proximally from mid forearm to the distal fingertips. If you are prepping your femoral line, your superior border will be the level of your anterior superior iliac spine, your inferior border will be your mid thigh, medial border would be your midline, and your lateral border would be laterally even up to the bed. It is important to prep wide, especially because when drapes are placed down, sometimes they are not always placed directly over the desired sterile area, and you will often see them lifted slightly and moved, and you want to make sure that when they are moved, they are moved from a sterile to a sterile area and not from a non-sterile to a sterile area and thus contaminated. It is important to prepare your sterile equipment, and this would include your needle and syringe and your guide wire to ensure that everything is functional and set up correctly. At this time, you want to perform your timeout and ensure that you are performing the procedure on the correct patient and you are performing the correct procedure and it is being performed at the correct site. Different institutions may have different policies on how to perform timeouts and the timing of timeouts, but regardless, a timeout should always be performed before either incision or insertion. We'll be talking about two insertion devices, an all-in-one device and a standard Seldinger technique device. The all-in-one device can be seen here. It has the white portion, which is the catheter itself, and the needle comes pre-inserted into the catheter. It has a guide wire, which is attached to this black tab, which exits from the tip of the needle when this black tab passes this black hash line here. And you can see the guide wire is flexible and soft. As the tip of the needle will not be visible once your puncture is below the level of the skin, this black hash mark is important to keep in mind. So if you feel pressure at this point, you will know that you are not within the vessel. As you insert your radial artery catheter, when you get into the radial artery itself, you should see a flash contained within this chamber right here of bright red blood. When you do, again, advance your guide wire and as long as you have no resistance when you continue to advance your wire you know the catheter the needle and the wire are all within the radial artery afterwards you would slowly advance the catheter over both the needle and the wire into the vessel itself 
and when you withdraw, you should see a brisk return of blood from the end of your catheter. So using the sheet as an example of skin, when we perform our initial stick, we would then slide our catheter forward or our guard wire forward and then slide our catheter forward and pull back. This is an example of, again, a radial artery catheter that does not have a guide wire system. Again, when you are below the level of the skin and you hit the vessel, you should see a flash within your chamber. However, there's no guide wire to advance. So once you get to your flash, you would simply advance the catheter over the needle into the vessel. Femoral artery catheters are somewhat longer than radial artery catheters for obvious reasons. Again, you'll need a guide wire for placement, and they do make all-in-one catheter insertions with guide wires included that are similar to the one demonstrated for the radial artery placement, although for the sake of variety, we'll be using a standard cell denture technique for the placement of this femoral artery catheter. When you start off, you'd start off with a needle that is of large enough caliber to accommodate a guide wire and when you insert below the skin and get into your vessel and ensure you have a flash when you remove your needle hub you should see very bright red pulsatile flow take your guide wire and insert and you should feel no resistance as you perform this once your wire is in place you want to maintain two-point control it is usually not necessary to cut the skin as the caliber of the catheter itself is very small. However, if you do, ensure that the blade of the needle is facing away from your wire so that you do not cut it. Similarly, you usually do not have to dilate the artery, although in the cases of atherosclerotic disease or significant vascular disease, it may be necessary. So. Once again, dilate and maintain two-point control of your wire as you do so. And then you insert the catheter yourself. And again, maintain two-point control as you do so. Step nine is confirmation. And the easiest way to do this is to observe an agreement between the arterial pressure from your arterial line and your non-invasive blood pressure cuff. In patients who are significantly hypotensive or who have laminar flow due to ventricular cyst devices and may not be necessarily pulsatile and there is question, an ABG can be drawn and you want to make sure that your values are within the normal range for an arterial sample. Arterial waveforms are characteristic and have different components. The first portion of the arterial waveform is the systolic wave, and on the downslope of the systolic wave is the characteristic dichrotic notch, which represents aortic valve closure. The arterial line should be ensured to have appropriate timing with the ECG monitor. The systolic wave should follow shortly after the QRS complex on the ECG monitor, with the peak of the systolic wave occurring slightly before the T wave and the dichrotic notch occurring slightly after the T wave. This systolic phase occurs on the ECG between the QRS complex and shortly after the T wave. After the dichrotic notch and shortly before the next upstroke represents the diastolic phase. Here we have examples of arterial tracing waveforms and on the image on the right, you can see the timing of the systolic wave initiation and the peak occurring slightly after the QRS complex and then towards the end of the T wave. When measuring blood pressure from an arterial tracing, the systolic number is the peak of the systolic wave and the diastolic number is the lowest point before the onset of the systolic wave. In this case, this particular patient has a blood pressure of 150 over 50. In this example, Again, correlation of timing can be seen, and the blood pressure in this patient can be seen as 100 over 55. Arterial waveforms obtained from different body sites will have different morphologies. The aortic tracing, radial artery tracing, and femoral artery tracing can all be seen as you move further from the heart itself 
the dichrotic notch is more difficult to see, and the femoral artery can, in this particular tracing is, again, stylistic. However, it is drawn without a significant dichrotic notch. If you were to superimpose all of these three values from a particular patient, you would see that as you move more distal from the heart, the recording of the systolic pressure is higher. Thus, the femoral artery has a higher pressure than the radial artery, and the radial artery has a higher pressure than the aorta, all in the same patient at the same time. This means if you have a patient who is hypotensive and you are measuring that hypotension from a femoral line, it is a more serious situation than a patient who is hypotensive and you are measuring that hypotension from a radial art line. Because at baseline, the femoral artery should be higher than the radial artery. So the degree of hypotension would be more severe in that particular case. The shape of the waveform can also be affected by rhythm disturbances and valvular disease, specifically aortic valvular disease. And on the upper left, you can see an example of atrial fibrillation, where beats that are more earlier than others and do not allow time for adequate filling can have smaller waveforms. On the upper right, you see an example of aortic insufficiency with its characteristic severely steep downslope. In the bottom center, we see an example of an arterial waveform in a patient with aortic stenosis. And you can see the uprise is less steep than in the normal arterial tracing. The non-invasive blood pressure cuff and the arterial line should correlate with each other to an extent. The intra-arterial pressure waveforms normally differ a little bit from your NIVP cuffs. Technically correct intra-arterial pressure waveforms are usually more accurate reflections of arterial pressure than non-invasive blood pressure cuffs. But sometimes you are faced with the difficult choice of which to believe, the arterial line or the non-invasive blood pressure cuff. And in that particular case, you can perform what is called a return to flow test. To perform this test, you place a manual blood pressure cuff above the radial A-line on the same side that it is placed. You would then inflate the blood pressure cuff until, while looking at the monitor, you saw a loss of your arterial waveform once your artery was occluded. You then slowly release the pressure within the blood pressure cuff while looking at the monitor. And when you see the first blip of the arterial tracing returning, you reclamp your blood pressure cuff and look at the needle position on the sphygmometer. The pressure on the cuff that correlates with the return to flow will tell you what your true arterial pressure is. And sometimes you will find that it correlates better with the non-invasive blood pressure cuff. Sometimes you will find it correlates better with the arterial line cuff. And sometimes you will find it is somewhere in between. But it can be helpful in distinguishing which number to rely on. It is important to remember that the information yielded from your arterial line can be good and it can be faulty. And this depends on your wave accuracy. Your wave accuracy is dependent on two characteristics mainly your resonant or your natural frequency of your system and your damping coefficient. And your resonant frequency is the frequency at which the system oscillates maximally. It is determined by the size, shape, and material of the components in the fluid-filled system. The damping coefficient is how quickly an oscillation will come to rest. All fluid-filled systems are inherently underdampened. Damping becomes an important factor if the natural frequency of the system is not optimal or adequate. And the way to test your resonant frequency and your dampening coefficient is to perform the square wave test. This is carried out by flushing the transducer, by pulling on the pigtail and then releasing quickly. This will result in a rapid change in arterial pressure from whatever the patient's inherent arterial pressure is to the pressure that is in the pressure bag, which should be kept at 300 millimeters of mercury. And a normal square wave test will look like this, and it is called a square wave test because it goes above the highest value on the monitor and thus creates the appearance of a square wave. When the pigtail is released and the pressure returns back to the patient's baseline blood pressure, you will see that it oscillates and bounces back a few times before it settles back into its arterial tracing. The qualities or the parameters of a normal square wave test are that there are at least one to two oscillations after the square wave, and there are less than one block between bounces 
if this is the case, the frequency of the system and the frequency of the response is optimal. If there are one to two blocks between the bounces, this is when you care about your dampening. You want to have adequate dampening such that the second bounce should only be less than one third the height of the first bounce. If there are greater than two blocks between bounces, then the resonant frequency response is also inadequate. So again, here, this time applying the concepts we know about the parameters of a normal square wave, we see a diagram where we have an arterial tracing and then a pigtail pulled such that a square wave appears and then released. And we can see that it oscillates and oscillates about one to two times. And it does so with less than one box between each oscillation. And the height of the second wave is less than one third of the height of the first. And so this represents a normal square wave. If your system is under dampened, you will end up overestimating your systolic blood pressure and you will underestimate your diastolic blood pressure. So you will have a more exaggerated tracing, thus leading you to have false information. When you perform a square wave test, you'll see that there are greater than two boxes between bounces, and the height of the second wave is close to the same height as the first wave. So it takes longer to oscillate down back to its baseline. An example of an over-dampened square wave test would be the absence of bounces. So you pull the pigtail, and you release, and you see that it slowly drops down back to its baseline. That would be an over-dampened tracing. And over-dampened lines underestimate systolic blood pressure and overestimate diastolic blood pressure. So they narrow your pulse pressure, whereas the over-dampened will widen your pulse pressure. And usually over-dampened is the more common, so we'll give more examples of these. We can see here, there's no bounce in the square wave as it returns back to its arterial tracing. In this example, we could see there's only one bounce before it returns. And here, again, there's no bounce. It slides back down. These are all over dampened systems. This would be an example of an optimally dampened system. And again, to put all of them next to each other, we can see what a normal arterial tracing would look like, followed by a normal square wave test, and then an over-dampened arterial tracing, followed by an over-dampened square wave test, and an under-dampened arterial tracing, followed by an under-dampened square wave test. And you can see how the over-dampened would narrow your pulse pressure and cause you to believe that you have a lower systolic and higher diastolic pressure, and the under-dampened would do the opposite. It would widen your pulse pressure and lead you to believe that your systolic is higher and your diastolic is lower. So what causes over dampening or under dampening? Over dampening can be caused by air bubbles within the tube system, and these can be troubleshot by flushing them out. Blood or fibrin can also cause it. And again, these can be flushed out or tubing can be exchanged. Kinks in the tubing as well will cause dampening and the wrong type of tubing. If you feel normal intravenous tubing and then you feel arterial line tubing, you'll see the difference is that the arterial line tubing is much harder. If you use tubing for venous fluid insertion in an arterial line system, you will find that you will have a significantly dampened waveform as the more softer, more compliant tubing will absorb more of the pressure. Under dampening is caused by having too much tubing, specifically too much of the hard tubing or numerous stopcocks, again, because of the rigidity within the system. Other causes of inaccuracy can be lines that are not zeroed and not leveled. And zeroing and leveling are also important, and these are concepts that are applied to all transducers, be it for arterial lines or central lines measuring CVPs or PA pressures from swarm gas catheters. The concepts are all the same. The purpose of zeroing and leveling is to eliminate hydrostatic pressure differences within fluid-filled systems by zeroing at an estimated level of the catheter tip within the patient's body. Generally during zeroing procedures, the stopcock is placed at the level of the, quote, flebostatic axis, which is the fourth intercostal space, mid-axillary line, or the mid-chest. To perform this procedure, the dead end cap is removed from the transducer, the transducer stopcock is turned off to the patient, and then the monitor is zeroed. When zeroing is complete, 
the transducer stop cock is turned back off to the port and the dead end stop cock is replaced. The mean arterial pressure is important to discuss. It is derived from the formula, the diastolic pressure plus one third of the quantity of the systolic minus the diastolic pressure. Using algebra, the formula can be rearranged to another option, which would be the systolic pressure minus two thirds the quantity of the systolic minus the diastolic pressure. It is important to keep in mind that this formula is derived from the fact that when your heart is beating between 60 to 80 beats per minute, you spend one third of your time in systole and about two thirds of your time in diastole. So when a patient has a tachycardia and their heart rate is in the 120s or 140s, the one third to two thirds relationship no longer exists and may be closer to one half to one half, in which case carrying out this formula mathematically would not apply. Monitors derive mean arterial pressure by calculating the area underneath the curve and thus tachycardia does not complicate this factor. Normal mean arterial pressure would range between about 70 to 105 for most people. If you have a system which is under dampened or over dampened slightly because of the reciprocal effects on diastolic and systolic pressure, you can use your mean arterial pressure which would be mathematically unaffected. Now this is up into a limit. If you have a patient who is so severely dampened, the tracing is nearly flatlined, that doesn't necessarily correlate with their mean pressure. Step 10 is communication. It is important to place an order such that the line is okay to use for blood draws and for monitoring. And an order for care for the line should be placed, describing its location and its frequency of monitoring and sampling. A procedure note should also be placed in the progress note section of the chart. The final step is removal. In general, you need to ensure that the patient has or will not need appropriate other arterial access. Check current labs to make sure the patient is not coagulopathic or thrombocytopenic. Check current anticoagulation medications. And generally upon removal, pressure should be held for about five minutes or until bleeding stops. If the patient is on significant anticoagulation, pressure may need to be held longer. After hemostasis is obtained, apply a dressing and instructs the patient to monitor and notify the nurse for any changes. In the case that the patient is sedated, then communication with the nurse is sufficient. It is important to follow up on the patients in about 15 minutes to ensure that the patient has good pulses, good perfusion, and continued hemostasis. You will need supplies for removal. Generally, if it's sutured in place, you'll need a suture removal kit, the gauze and adhesive tape. This has been a quick review of arterial line placement. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. As always, when incorporating a new procedure into your clinical skill set, it's first important to gather all the relevant knowledge surrounding the topic and then to develop the manual skills necessary, practice on a mannequin, and eventually in a controlled clinical setting in the presence of your supervising physician, uh, then perform the procedure on an actual patient. You should be in compliance with your hospital's bylaws and your state laws as well as you gain experience. So I wish you the best of luck and as always, thank you for your time and your interest.